Hey everyone, this is Nathan Palmer from sociologyandfocus.com, and I'm here today with Dr. Jeff Manza of NYU and co-author of The Sociology Project, a new introduction to sociology textbook um, that's available now. Um, he's agreed to answer some of our questions, and I'm dying to find out what kind of teacher he is and what he wants to do in his classes. So I'm just going to start, uh, well first of all, let me just say uh, thank you Jeff for, for being on. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Absolutely. So, what makes uh, an introduction to sociology class different than um, all the upper level sociology classes that you teach? I know you teach uh, inequality a lot, I believe, um, and some other classes. So how does the introduction class differ? Well, I think first off, we have a different and a, a bigger group typically of students who come into the intro courses. Depending on the university or college, uh, you know, we may have nurses, we may have criminal justice majors, uh, you know, business majors, people taking breadth courses who will, will never take another sociology course. So part of our challenge, I think, in the intro course is to make sociology interesting to students who wouldn't necessarily have taken it except for the fact that it's required for their program. And also, I think it's a great opportunity for us to show students how studying sociology can not only uh, uh, be interesting in and of itself, but enrich their lives in a variety of ways and give them some tools to, uh, you know, move forward in their both educational and professional lives. You know, and I think that you uh, touched on this just a second ago, but I'd like to maybe probe you a little bit further about, um, so, you know, for most students, actually, I think for most people in, in the country, this intro class is going to be their only especially only formalized experience with sociology. So in the, in the sense that most of your students aren't your majors and most of them will never touch sociology again in their lives in a formalized way, what role do you think the introduction, so introductory classes serve um, for sociology as a discipline? Well, I think uh, three things that strike me as especially important to try to get across in an intro course. So the first thing that I think um, <clears throat> is uh, just really important and I think is a term they can take away and, and understand is, is the idea of a sociological imagination. What does that mean? How and in what ways can we think about questions or issues that come up in everyday life as sociological questions? And I think conveying to our students what it means to think sociologically um, and giving them a nice little term they can take, they will remember, they may only remember a couple of things from our class, but if they can get them to remember the idea of a sociological event and what that means, the idea of thinking about individual lives in historical and, and social political contexts, how problems that we think are individual problems are really oftentimes kind of broader social problems, those kind of simple messages, I think, are is one thing we can we can kind of get across in our intro class, and uh, is a simple set of tools that even a student who's not necessarily especially engaged can take away. Second thing that I emphasize, and we emphasize in our in our, our book throughout our book, the Sociology Project, and I try to do in my own class, is to really help students formulate questions about the world around them, learning how to ask. Question, questioning received wisdom, questioning how and why certain things happen or, or don't happen, how, you know, in what ways do they uh, um, have opportunities, not have opportunities, why is that the case? Being able to ask questions about the world around them. So they may kind of remember from my sociology class that, oh, yeah, that's the class, you know, we learn to ask questions. And it's something that I think everybody, as they get older and, and mature, uh, whether they go to college or not, has develops the capacity to begin asking questions about things they might have once accepted when they were younger and, and less experienced. But we can really push that along as we, um, you know, in our in our sociology class, and, and we're really thinking, talking about questions about society, questions about. Uh, you know, the worlds we, we inhabit. And then I guess the third thing is to try to give them some really important empirical and, you know, research-based findings that, you know, they can take away. And, 
you know, it depends on the subject matter and the particular interest of instructors and, you know, what those kind of what those might be. But there have always been some some great kind of classical ideas in sociology that um, are, you know, very, very provocative for students that once they kind of get those little ideas, they, they can actually carry some of some of them send them with them around as they move move forward. In there. So I, 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 you know, well, obviously, I would like all students to not only have Kind of learned those things or gotten something out of those three kind of components, basic components. I'd also like them to know some sociology and engage with social. But realistically, at a base, at a minimum baseline, if we could kind of help students, all students, kind of think about and learn a little bit about each of those three elements, then I think uh, we've conveyed something useful in the course. You know, and I think your last point kind of nailed what I'd like to ask you next, which is I think most. No, no, I mean, I'm going to say every student walks into the room with uh, preconceived ideas, common sense, uh, anecdotal experiences, um, stereotypes that, in a sense, can sometimes be barriers to students' learning, actually often are barriers to student learning. And so I was wondering if um, how you address those barriers, how you try to overcome those barriers, either in your class or in the book, um, and also in what ways can we kind of use, since they're bringing that to us anyways, I mean, do you, are there any ways that you kind of use what they already know and use those anecdotal experiences in a way that can be kind of pedagogically valuable? Yeah, this is, a, I think, a great question that gets right to the challenge, one, right to the heart of one of the biggest challenges of teaching introductory sociology, which is that all, all of our students, in a sense, have been doing sociology around the dinner table, at their schools, uh, interacting with whatever churches, other organizations they, they are involved in, their sports teams. Their, so they think they have been building up a, uh, a stock of knowledge, if you will, that is not grounded in soci sociological knowledge or research, but, but is kind of based on folk wisdom and experiences that they've had. And those experiences can often be very misleading, as, as we know. Um, so part of the challenge in that intro course, I think, is to kind of break you know, trying to help them understand the difference between kind of what we might call conventional wisdom, folk wisdom, and sociological wisdom or sociological understandings that are, that are kind of grounded in more systematic evaluation of the worlds around us and the questions that we, that we pose. So it's a, tra it's a, it's a challenge for all instructors. Um, one thing I found is that, um, it's often useful to get students talking not so much about their own thoughts, but about asking them kind of what do people typically think about some, let's take race, you know, what are some of, so instead of asking the students to kind of convey, let's say, some stereotypes they as individuals might hold about particular racial or ethnic groups, we ask how do other people or how, how do, you know, people you know what kinds of stereotypes might they have and kind of get those out on the table and sort of talk about stereotypes, not as nece I mean, they can have evil and pernicious consequences, but they're also ways of, of, you know, simplifying ideas, simplifying lots of disparate ideas into something that we can hold on to and, and kind of using examples of, of students talking about, you know, maybe their parents, their, their racist relatives who say, you know, bad things at the, you know, at the family gathering, using that as the kind of hook to get them to think about stereotypes without, you know, necessarily directly putting them on the spot, which I think particularly on a topic like race or gender or some of the more contentious things that, that are, you know, that we typically cover in intro courses, are often hard to get students to talk about in terms of their own thoughts, and they don't want to embarrass themselves in front of the class and so right. forth. But oftentimes getting them to talk about people they know and, and ideas that are widely shared in, in their communities, that's something they're very willing to do. And then that opens the door. And, you know, you kind of at the end of the section of that section, that topic, you can kind of nudge back to let's always remember that, you know, we, we ourselves have, have stereotypes that impact how we think about um, different groups in, in society. Um, but, but really trying to use, get them to talk about other, in the third person, as it were, uh, about other, other groups and other people they know, I think is, a, is one way to kind of get at that, that kind of basic knowledge that they, that they have that's often wrong. 
Yeah, and absolutely. And uh, I think you're bringing, that's a really great point because I think what students are unaware of, and I would even argue majority of the general population are unaware of, are how much people's point of view is a way of externalizing and abstracting their, you know, kind of internal point of view. And in, in a way they haven't like necessarily thought of or processed out. And because, all, I mean, I think a lot of times students are saying, but everybody knows that, which is another right. way of saying, I have always believed is true until the moment you challenged me, you know? And right. so when you get to kind of let them get that like one removed kind of discussion, hopefully they can kind of pull back and, you know, uh, take what they've learned in that abstract back to the kind of personal, which is in a way a different form, form but in another way of the sociological imagination. I can talk about it out here. Now let's see if I can personalize it back to me. Yeah, it's always important to try to bring it back, but one doesn't want to do it all the time, every class, right. you know, beat them over the head. Rather, you, you kind of want to, you know, do it more in a more subtle way, but but firmly throughout, you know, at various points in the course. And, you know, one way to do that, I think, is to put yourself on the line in some mm -hmm. sense and talk about ways in which, you know, you had, mis you misperceived certain um, ideas, uh, situations, grew, you know, had ideas about that. That's always a, a way to kind of help them. And then you can kind of talk about your own experiences of kind of overcoming those biases, assumptions, mistaken notions um, by using a sociological lens to put it in a broader in a broader context. Um, and that that I think is often a very effective way to do it if you're willing to kind of stick your neck out a little. And, and you know, you don't have to make yourself seem like a complete moron at point, at, you know, time one. And now right. you're, you know, the oracle of, uh, of <laughs> sociology at time two, but but rather just small points that things that come up in everyday, everyday life, things that, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, useful nuggets, examples. Yeah. And your role modeling the learning process then kind of going first and the kind of because there is the learning process is acknowledging vulnerability. I didn't know something, you know, and I have to accept that and then fill that gap. And that's tough. Yeah, for students. This, this this is, I think, also a really great point. This is something we really try to build into the logic of our of our book. Um, which is the idea that sociology is a collective project, a collective enterprise. We're all doing sociology. We don't know it. We don't use that language. But, but when we sit down at the dinner table with our families and we begin making observations about the local economy, the, uh, you know, the, the church we go to, the, the school system, the, you know, uh, the local government, the <clears throat> any number of different things that, that you know, we may begin to talk about, our friends, our, you know, friends' marriages, our, our, you know, families that we know of, so forth. All of these things have a, a, a kind of um, sociological core to them. And if we kind of think about sociology as a kind of collective project, something we're all engaged in, I have something to learn from you. You have something to learn from me. We have a lot to learn from each other is, I think, really where um, we begin to get a certain kind of leverage with our students and sort of help them. Now, they won't all kind of begin to think that way in a sociology, uh, in an introductory course. Right. But I think, con you know, conveying the idea that I don't know it, you know, this, the problems sociologists try to deal with are inherently difficult. The causes of crime, you know, the causes of poverty, the causes of high divorce rate. I mean, these are inherently difficult problems. We have gained knowledge over time. We know more about them than we did 40 years ago. I would absolutely insist on that. But on the other hand, there there may be problems that are that are intractable and problems where the you know it's kind of a moving target that you know the problem of poverty is different now than it was in 1950 uh, because the economy has changed. The you know urban communities have changed so forth. So, so we're not only dealing with hard things, or they're also moving targets. So I think using this language of kind of a collective project, learning from each other, contributing to a joint effort across all of society, I think is a really, really useful way to kind of help excite students, you know, or get them into the idea that, you know, this is a this isn't like economics or physics where you know there's one and only one right answer. Right. It's a right. field where we learn how to think about things that don't necessarily have simple answers, but things that are inherently important uh, in our everyday, everyday lives. You know, and I think you're bringing up, um, the, the, walking me straight to my next question that I'd like to ask you about, which is the kind of epic debate between like depth or breadth, right? Should you cover 
16 chapters, you know, as, as little as possible, but, you know, a mile wide, an inch deep. Or, you know, I mean, there are some, some of my friends who think that basically they're there to teach kind of the core of sociology, and then that primarily includes race, class, and gender. And then if you want all of, like, environment, or if you want, you know, any of these kind of, uh, like, family, or any of these other kind of, I don't want to say niche topics, because they're not niche topics, but, you know, the kind of um, what many people don't see as the, I can't even say that, because there's just, that's the problem. There is no agreement. We cannot, like, yeah. at ASA this year, if we had a poll, what's the common core, we would find out that it sort of doesn't exist. And so how do you yeah. deal with that? How do you deal with, because you're introducing them, so how do you deal with figuring out which topics to cover at what depth and which ones, you know, might have to get left out? Right, right. Right. Well, it's it's I, I guess what I would say about this is I would kind of come back to what we started with, which is that if you think about what are the things we want our students to take out of the course, it's probably going to be less about detailed knowledge about religion, really detail or at least the average student in the class, the very best students, you know, we can have higher ambitions for. But sort of for the average student who, again, may be taking sociology one because it's required for their program, may taking it as a gen ed course, they're not really, you know, that average student, we want them to come out of the class with, with a handful of, of tools that they can use elsewhere. Um, in, in some sense, I think you can get those tools, whether you do breadth, you know, whether you really kind of focus on a narrower core and you, you kind of zero in a little more, a little more detail, or whether you cover a, a wider range of topics. And I think different, you know, different instructors are going to be, you know, have different ideas about this. And I don't think there's really, there is really one answer. I mean, I, I, uh, I think you're absolutely right, that it would be difficult to get uh, anything approaching consensus about what the core is in, you know, in sociology. Um, so I think of the core, you know, as those kind of three things that I started with, which is, you know, um, the sociological imagination, learning how to ask questions, and learning, at least grasping a couple of key empirical nuggets that help you understand why sociology can actually change the way we think about the world. And it, it almost doesn't matter what those nuggets are, as long as you kind of get them to see that's interesting, exciting, and counterintuitive, and show them what those are. So I think you can do that either with a course that has, you know, 15 topics in 15 weeks, or 13 topics in 15 weeks, or a course that, that's more narrowly focused, but still has to, you know, has to ask those kind of broader questions, and uh, kind of think about, you know, what the outcomes are that we're trying to get to. So this one's a little bit more fun of a question. So if you could wave a magic wand and fix some issue that is common to all so, sociology, let's just say all classes, like one thing that either students do or, you know, like anything, anything that you pick, pick one thing that you could wave a magic wand and change, what would it be and why? Well, I think that uh, the thing that I would want to change, and it, it's um, it's somewhat less of a problem at New York University, and and where we have you know more resources for for teaching assistants and than than you know the vast majority of university. But I, I would want to make it easier to assign and rigorously grade writing assignments. So I think that you know it learning how to put something down on paper and and integrate it and make make it sensible and make it into an argument that has a you know draws on that is a really critical challenge that i think in, in american higher ed we've we've um you know we're we're not doing a great job across the board in in both um teaching our students how to, you know, put ideas and information down on paper. And we often don't have, have the tools or the resources to, you know, so if you're, you know, if you're teaching uh, two sections of intro with 150 students and, you know, you may have, you know, you may just have one, one grader, you know, it's, it's just very hard to, to assign writing and, and give them realistic feedback. And uh, that I think is the thing that, you know, it's, it's a structural problem for the way we, currently organized uh, our universities and it, you know, so that I think would be the thing I would want to, that would be the first thing that I would want to try to improve on. I could think of others, but that would be really the, the, the thing I would look at first. 
And, and we'll wrap it up on this. So if you were talking to um, a new faculty member, someone who's just starting out, what advice or wisdom would you impart upon them? Um, you mean in with teaching? I, I, I guess yeah. I would say... Absolutely, with teaching, uh, sorry. I guess I, I guess I... Well, so the very first thing that I would say, uh, you know, is that we, we don't really l typically learn how to teach while we're in graduate school or, you know, before we actually set foot in the classroom. There are exceptions and there are programs that do a good job with it. But for the m most, uh, as, you know, young faculty members, young instructors facing their first class really don't know much about, how, you know, what to do. So almost every university I know of does provide some resources for beginning teachers, one kind or another. And they're often voluntary. They're, you're not required to go through them. But taking advantage of whatever those are, I think, is something could be, you know, really useful to, to um, sort of, you know, begin to, you know, as you begin to develop. Talking to your more senior colleagues about, you know, what learning about, you know, the students at a, you know, you come to a new institution and there's always certain peculiarities of the local culture and the, you know, students, student body, things that, you know, kind of talking to your, your senior colleagues and trying to get a feel for that. Looking at their syllabi to kind of see, you know, those who've been teaching there for a while, you begin to develop a feel for what the students can and cannot handle. And oftentimes we're, when we first start out, we're very ambitious that, you know, we, we think, you know, we can get our, we can excite our students to do, you know, more reading than realistically we can because they've got jobs and they've got heavy loads and they've got other lives and it just doesn't always work that way. Um, so those would be a few things that, that I would, um, but I, I really think it's it's um, we, we really learn kind of by doing it. And so the more we do it, you know, the more practice you get, the better the better you get at it. And I'm certainly a better teacher now than I was when I when I started. I mean, I have horrible night and recollections and nightmares being standing in front of a giant class at Penn State, not really knowing, you know, having the first idea of what I what I was supposed to do there in front of those those students. And, uh, you know, I think I think you 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 know, you, you shouldn't necessarily uh, you know, be too hard on yourself those that first semester, that that first year, that first two years, just partly because um, you know you will get better and it will get a lot easier. And you know that first time going through a new class, it's really challenging, and you know you 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 feel like you never are fully prepared for each class. But after a while, you begin to kind of realize that being underprepared has certain advantages. It's not really a good idea to over prepare every single point because then you end up doing too much lecturing. You don't really allow surprises in the classroom. You don't allow student, you know, but when you're kind of, you have some notes, but you know, you're not completely right out every single thing you want to cover. It, it allows for certain, you know, interaction with the students and kind of more active learning kind of setting. And so I've kind of really, you know, as I've gotten more experience, I, I really prepare. i, I I probably prepare more than I realize, but I do, what I don't do in preparing for classes is have very, very detailed, elaborate notes the way I used to when I first started teaching. And, you know, I remember my biggest panic was running out of things to say, that somehow I would not have enough to fill up an hour and 15 minutes. And it took me probably a good two years to realize that never happens. I always have more to say than I have time to say it. Absolutely. And you know, but 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 fearing that you're you know you're not going to have enough time and trying to get through all these different things that you want to say. I think learning how to relax a little and and recognize that you know sociology should be a class where the students are you know as I said earlier a collective project. Students are participating in the the kind of the learning that's going on and involving them in it. Um, so those are all a few things I would tell a beginning sociology instructor um, uh, you, you know at the at the outset of their teaching careers All right, well thank you very much for your time thanks uh, thanks Nate thanks for having me